I think we'll go ahead and get started. Vancouver? Yeah. Can somebody, Vancouver, Spokane, Everett, Tri-Cities? Good morning, everybody. Can y'all hear me? Mike, can you hear me? That lower blue I thought was us. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I am really excited to see this activity actually come to fruition. I really want to thank all of the pan all of the members of the planning committee that we've represented all six campuses. Um, I'm Rebecca Vandevoort, Assistant Vice President for Academic Outreach and Innovation. Uh, we have. I, I'm not going to introduce everybody on the planning committee because I know I'll miss miss someone, but all six campuses were represented. We had faculty and tech staff, and that is, um, so this day is a result of a conversation between Vice President Dave Soleil from Academic Outreach and Innovation and the chancellors on all of the other campuses, and a desire to really spur academic innovation. And the goals are multiple, but really, in my opinion, they all relate to connections. So connecting faculty across the system to share um, how they're using technology to support teaching and learning, to learn from others, to create uh, that community spirit of um, support and mentoring and peer relationships across all the WSU campuses. We're connecting um, faculty with folks across the system who provide support for academic technology. So oftentimes I go out and talk to people on our campus, the Pullman campus and other campuses and hear, well, I, I don't really know where to go or who to talk to. So that is part of what we're trying to do here as well as to connect those of us who support academic technology on the various campuses so that we make sure that we're doing the job that you need done, that all of the holes are filled and we're not creating confusion through um, territorial kinds of conversations so that we're all really working together to support faculty, faculty know where to come, how to get help, how to get support. Um, and lastly, we're really demonstrating the power of technology to connect all of us in terms of teaching and learning, uh, how we can use it with students, pushing the boundaries. So I really want to thank you all for participating in this. Um, we do have throughout the day several different sessions and 165 registrations for those multiple sessions. Um, I think most of the sessions will look like we have small numbers, but we also do record and archive all of what we do. Uh, so we will have this information up on websites. People can follow up, go back, look and see and find out what you've um, remember what you forgot, perhaps. So <laughs> I want to kind of uh, plan out the, or describe the day. So we've got an opening panel this morning. We're really looking at sort of a general overview of what are the numbers of different ways that people are using technology to support teaching and learning. And then through each session, we'll really delve into those. So if you hear something this morning that's interesting, you think, wow, I'd really like to use my Blackboard course space differently, or I'm really looking for tools that will help me engage students, then we'll have a follow-up session on that. So um, we, do, we, will, we should have plenty of time for questions at all of our sessions. I think all of the presenters are willing to be contacted um, should you want more information, and you could get that through me or through the tech support on your individual campuses. Um, so I want to start the morning with a few comments from our Vice President, Dave Soleil. Hi, I'm Dave Soleil. I'm the Vice President for Academic Outreach and Innovation here at Washington State University. I am very disappointed that I can't be with you today. As many of you know in this room, or many of you in this room know, we've been talking about leveraging the system to support academic technology at Washington State University for some time. And it's so cool that you guys could make that happen today. It's very impressive that all of the campus have come together as partners to support and deliver this program. And I do believe it's, it's this work, it's this type of work that, that pushes the university, that drives us to challenge our perceptions, the things that we think we know, and do things in a different way to improve student learning, 
faculty engagement. And although the, the impact might be small from our work today, if we continue that momentum, those small changes can lead to big, impactful moments for this university. So that said, it's, a, it's impressive that you're here today engaging. More importantly, I hope that work continues. I hope our partnership, our collaboration continues throughout this year and, and into next. I think our work has to be measured. It has to be egalitarian, where we all bring our best to the table to assess and implement. So with that, I hope you benefit from our time here today. More importantly, I hope you help others benefit from your time here today. So with that, thank you and have fun. So I just want to mention uh, one of the things we will experience today are some technology glitches. You just, you ha it's a given. If you're using technology in your classroom, if you're using technology for presentations, there's going to be glitches. And part of what we need to share and talk about is how do, you, how do you cope with that? What do you do when you're standing up in front of the classroom and it doesn't quite work? So that always has to be part of the conversation. Um, I also want to take a minute just to thank our AOI crew. Um, this is always a lot of work for our media team to get all of the streaming and set up. They've been here since 7. They'll be here long after the rest of us go home. So, um, and our marketing staff, there's just been a whole lot of people. Our Theron is busy with our streamers. Um, and so we do have people on every campus as well as about 40 people streaming live, which is part of the point of the mics. It doesn't help the people in the room, but the people on the stream can't hear if you're not speaking into the mic. So if you've got questions, we'll be running around with the mics. Um, for our opening panel, we have Phil Mixture on the Pullman campus, Connie Remsberg on the Spokane campus talking about delivering to Yakima and Willie Kushwa on the Vancouver campus. So I'm gonna hand the mic to Phil. Take it away, Phil. Thank you, Rebecca. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity today and uh, hopefully uh, I will ask those branch campuses, can you see what I see, which is a, a PowerPoint screen? Is that something you can yes, see? Yes, you can. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're moving forward in that direction. Um, again, in this particular case, uh, what I wanna do today is talk about a small example, an easy example, a way in which my uh, teaching has moved from a more passive delivery to a more active delivery, and the way uh, we've leveraged technology to do that. I guess I'm in control here. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, some context so you understand my class a little bit, and then uh, we're gonna move forward in addition uh, with a clear example. I believe in active learning, so I'm not gonna stand here and lecture you about, to you about active learning. That would somehow defeat the purpose. But moreover, uh, I wanna go into this and get you thinking about ways to convert your learning to active learning, and uh, as Dave Salif said, leverage the technology to foster interaction with your students. So uh, moving forward, uh, let's uh, go ahead and remind you that for me, uh, these uh, objectives you see are really some of the reasons for doing active learning, and again, I know uh, some of you are here already for this reason, uh, but in my classes, I'm training young scientists who are going to go on to become uh, pre-professionals, maybe they're pre-pharmacy, pre-dent, uh, maybe they want to go to WSU's new medical school, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, they're at a stage in their learning where they have the basics and they need to uh, become self-directed learners. Uh, we want them to welcome the internet. We want them to bring the internet into their learning and we want them to be critical learners. I'm sorry to interrupt. But okay. You're kind of blocking out the projection screen there. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I will move forward. All right, uh, thanks for some coaching there. Um, I'm, I'm an active uh, lecturer, so uh, getting me to stand still is difficult. All right, um, the point is uh, we want interaction and we want to socialize the learning in this particular context. And uh, I do that in a number of ways, but it's not uncommon for me to do inquiry-based assignments where I send students out to the internet to find things they want to find, bring them back, share them among each other, and foster discussion. Now, uh, the other thing that's important to note is that technology is not a substitute for good pedagogy. 
right? Good instructional design is aided by technology uh, and just using technology alone isn't the same as learning. So it's important that you bring your good instructional design to these exercises. You have objectives in order. I'm not going to burden you with those today, uh, but what we want to do in this particular context is get students learning by doing actively, and in my case, that's going to uh, involve, as I say, sending them out. Uh, so in uh, this regard, uh, I'm gonna give you an assignment, and I'm actually gonna give you time today live uh, to work on this assignment. Uh, in the past, I might have lectured you about how technology captures images of microbes in this particular course. But here's what I'd like you to do for the next 90 seconds, two minutes. Uh, you've got a great internet-aided device in front of you or in your pocket. Uh, find an image of your favorite microbe and uh, be prepared to share in about uh, 90 seconds, all right? I can't see you on branch campuses, but the folks here in Pullman are looking at me like, really? Okay, you don't have to be a scientist to have a favorite microbe. And I'll let you work, but I'll do that annoying thing where I talk while you're working so you have, have to multitask like our students. Where would you find an image of a micro? What search engine would you choose, right? Maybe you already have one as a background photo on your laptop. Yes, Rebecca, question. You're, oh, you're ready to share? Okay. So, I went to uh, Google and Googled microbe and found microbe world.org, what is a microbe, and microimages, and I like Saccharomyces cerevisiae fungi? Yeah, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, and that's because, that's because you like brewer's yeast and the products they produce, right? Yeah, I didn't that, know that. That is exactly I what you found. That. All right, so uh, again, in this particular case, uh, I hope the rest of you have found a microbe. What I would ask you to do, and I had the opportunity to use Brian 404 this summer, which is a prototype here on the Pullman campus for the new digital classroom that's being constructed. It's an area where you have small tables, you have small groups, each table has a monitor. I could ask students to put their submissions up on the monitor so in real time we can see that. We might leverage technology that way. And in addition, uh, I might ask you to post this to a Blackboard thread in real time. Okay, so we, the other thing I could do is just go to the Blackboard thread and watch it grow, okay? Uh, there are a couple of important reasons why I do that. One is to try and capture what students doing. Remember, in Blackboard, you can assess student participation very easily. You can see who posted, who, who wasn't in class today. It's kind of a backwards way of doing attendance, maybe. Uh, but it, it really holds students accountable. The other thing it does by, by having them post uh, it, it's public discourse about my favorite microbe. There's no wrong answer here, right? Uh, you have favorites for various reasons. Rebecca likes uh, brewer's yeast. Maybe she uses it when she makes bread instead of making beer, uh, but we all make choices, right? So uh, the point is with Blackboard, uh, you'd actually have a resource uh, that you can reflect on later. Again, a, a lot of the concerns I hear about just-in-time teaching or uh, rapid use of technology uh, is it's transient. It's hard to capture. It's hard for students to reflect on later uh, when they want to learn more uh, after class. And posting to Blackboard, again, uh, in this very low-stakes way is a very inviting way to engage your students, all right? Um, now the question is, when you look at the image that you found, uh, is it in color, is it in black and white? Right? And what's the technologies that help you visualize microbes? In my world, again, microbes weren't around until we had technology to visualize them. And some of you have probably been involved in a uh, science lab at some point in your life where you've looked through a microscope and seen that unseen world, all right? But now we have a lot of technologies. And the other thing that's important is there are a lot of uh, graphic 
depictions of microbes. So I talked to my students about whether you found an image that was a true uh, scientific artifact or was it a graphic artist's interpretation. And that adds a whole nother level to their information competency and their ability to discriminate between something they find credible and something that uh, maybe was uh, uh, perhaps uh, warped a little bit as the artist tried to interpret something scientifically. Uh, ultimately, uh, now we're gonna get to the point where different microbes have different shapes, they have different appendages, uh, based on the technology you're using, you can see them at different levels. You can zoom uh, very far in. You can see details associated with their membranes and little molecules on the surface. Or you can see from the blimp a big group of microbes that form an aggregate. Uh, and we can begin to talk about things like microbial shapes and microbial features and anatomy. These are all parts of my learning goals for this exercise. Uh, but again, students get to share their uh, favorite and uh, that's very important, all right? So uh, what I like to do maybe uh, with help from the branch campuses, if you would use a microphone. So if you were a student, uh, what would you see as the, the strengths and challenges of an exercise like this? Uh, in real terms, as you think about converting some of your exercises to ones that are active and ones that use technology, uh, what would the students think about this. Anyone have any reflection there? Here in Vancouver, question? Comment? Yeah, yeah, over here in Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, I, I would see a diversity of devices in the classroom, like uh, computers, cell phones, different platforms, Macs, uh, Microsoft. You guys right. hear that over there? I'm sorry, I missed that. Could you repeat that? Can you guys, can you guys hear, hear, could you guys oh, hear that over here? Yes, we can hear you. Thank okay, you good. very much. Okay, great. All right, and that was Vancouver. Uh, other campuses have some input. Uh, if you were a student, what would you think about this particular exercise? Good, good or bad? Here from Spokane, I, I think it would be engaging because so many of our students are um, using their phones anyways. Does that make sense? So we might as well embrace that within um, our classroom setting. Yeah, in some cases, the, the phones are more powerful than the classroom computer, right? So, uh, and, and again, encouraging them to go to uh, the vast expanse of the internet for classroom discussion um, makes perfect sense, all right? Um, Folks in Pullman, uh, I, can, I can hand you the mic. Yeah, well, just one thing, because I don't look at microbes on a daily basis, and if you are a student, and maybe this is an early exercise in a classroom, y you see a lot of images very quickly. Uh, and so I don't think about microbes, and I, there are many different. I really like the animated or the cartoon. Uh, so it makes you think if you pick out your favorite, you have to flick through a number of images and then just what is it that this image has that the other image doesn't have that says something to you about microbes. I thought that was kind of interesting. Thank you. All right, um, really appreciate your engagement. Uh, so let's think about it as an instructional exercise and let's think about it in terms of how you might design uh, something in this regard. What would be the strengths and challenges uh, from your perspective as an instructor uh, and, and needing to uh, meet certain educational goals that you set in front of you? Anyone have any input here? What I think is I see it as a peer learning as well, and students are learning from each other because everybody is uh, bringing up their own favorite micro picture. So, and in an instance, you are bringing up so much information in front of the students and they're learning from each other. I think that's uh, a big advantage for an instructor. Thank you, Vancouver. So uh, again, we've, we've taken away the, uh, you know, expert in front is the only person who knows something and we've really empowered students to take control, be self-directed, and share and socialize in their discussion about 
uh, these classroom things, all right? Uh, anyone uncomfortable letting go of the steering wheel? Boy, that's way too much power for students, isn't it? <laughs> right? They, they, they don't know what you know. They're not experts yet. Uh, it's a little bit scary. And as I say, if you have uh, clear objectives, you're probably going to find an example of, uh, of, say, that microbial structure. Or uh, you're going to find a student who picks uh, the plushy, fuzzy microbe dolls that you can actually buy. I know some of you don't buy these, but I do. And uh, the point is, in that diversity, uh, every year it's going to be dynamic, it's going to be a little different, but uh, you're also going to see a lot of examples that will hit your educational goals. You want to have an example that looks like this. Again, you could provide students with a list, but having them organically grow that list uh, is really a wise thing. And I know some of you use uh, you know, some sort of approach uh, generating a, uh, a wiki was the way we used to do it, but compiling a database uh, really gives students some empowerment uh, in terms of their own learning. All right, uh, so I, um, I'm programmed for 15 minutes, but I don't want to drone on here. Uh, I want to move forward, and we'll see if I can get the technology to do that. Sorry, Ruth. And uh, I wonder if there's other discussion as you think about uh, this example informing your own exercises as you move to a more active uh, role as a facilitator in your classrooms. Uh, what are some of the concerns you have in uh, using this model as you develop new classroom materials uh, and, and employ technology in this sort of way? Anyone? classroom going to have a cell phone on them or a computer? Some may not. I mean, I, maybe I'm naive, but um, I know that most students probably do, but maybe sometimes they won't. Yeah, so that's a, that's a concern. What is, what is the potential for a student uh, who can't afford an expensive device in their pocket? Uh, in the digital classroom, Brian 404 here on the Pullman campus, uh, again, the tables have uh, a monitor and a computer, so there there is a static system available to a small group, and uh, that would solve that problem if you have a technology-enabled classroom. Uh, if you form smaller groups of three or four uh, to sort of compartmentalize or chunk this exercise, uh, chances are greater that one out of four students have a device that could could search the internet, could access. Uh, but that's that's a legitimate concern. And again, in my classes, uh, I'm, I'm pretty upfront about uh, using technology, welcoming students to have their phones out. They may be doing other things when I'm not watching, but uh, yeah, it, it's possible, right? Uh, other concerns or uh, questions as you think about how you might modify your own teaching in this way? Um, I would make a... Oh. Sorry. Go right ahead. Oh, I was saying, um, I find it, I was listening to the, the group, that's what we do in Everett, um, having small groups for those who don't wind up having a laptop or a, a smartphone with them. Or sometimes when we're dealing, because I'm with comm students, so if we're asking um, students to work together and create a collage, let's say around a brand, I'll say, hey, if somebody wants to sketch something, draw it and have somebody take a quick snapshot for you and post it. So we can work that way as well. Um, but what, what concerns me is when the technology doesn't work to our advantage or when there's a glitch or when the wireless doesn't work quite right. That's very frustrating when we're dealing with a flipped classroom. So yep. working around that is... <laughs> As we crazy. discovered today, uh, technology is, is incredible but uh, can fail. And my experience is that students find great low-tech ways to get around uh, high-tech problems. And in some cases, for example, uh, with a Blackboard post, the way I've designed this, you could say, well, the, the router's not working in our room today, but before class uh, tomorrow or in the next 24 hours, uh, I want you to do that post. And that also includes a diversity of students. If you have someone who, uh, who's pretty introverted, doesn't want to do things publicly, that gives them the opportunity to do it that way. You have someone who processes more slowly than another student, uh, giving them two minutes to do an assignment like this is terrorizing for them. Uh, so you can 
uh, provide some alternatives, especially when the technology fails, but that's a good point. Great. Question from Pullman. In the past, when I've brought up the idea of reflective exercises, I've met pushback from faculty. Uh, so how is reflection seen by um, some who, in many cases, are su my superior? So uh, the question is about reflective, uh, sort of self-directed uh, assignments. I think if you make the expectations clear, and in some cases you're transparent about uh, summarizing, maybe you come back the next day a after reviewing those reflections and uh, hit on some themes to just point out the things you should have learned from this uh, type of exercise. Uh, that's useful for the students to clarify uh, what, what the expectation is and then also allows you to bring together some thematic elements that you would have talked about uh, if you were delivering a lecture in, in the older model. Um, but it also allows you to shine a spotlight on some really great examples or some uh, common student misconceptions or uh, errors that students commonly make as they go into this because they're novices rather than experts. So I think there's an opportunity to revisit a reflective assignment in a way that can be really productive. Uh, many faculty members are worried about uh, reading, reaching their content goals, right? They wanted to cover this, they know another course requires students to know this, it was my job to cover that, but I sent them out to the internet and they all wandered off uh, away from what I wanted them to work on. So I think if you come back to it, you've got an opportunity to redirect in some ways. Maybe others have ideas as well. Great, great question. All right, um, I think my time is over and I will pass on technologically pass the baton, is that what I'm doing? I'll hand Ruth this microphone. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and again, uh, look forward to working with you. All right, we're moving to Connie in Spokane. Can you see my content? Okay, perfect. All right, so to introduce myself, my name is Connie Remsberg. I'm from the College of Pharmacy up here on the Spokane campus, and I lead up teaching and learning efforts for our college. Um, so today I'm gonna briefly go over kind of a new approach that we're taking with our extension <coughs> campus. So in the fall of uh, 2015, so last fall, um, the College of Pharmacy opened a extension campus on the Pacific Northwest University campus in Yakima. And so prior to this, um, opening of the campus, we had a long conversation in the College of Pharmacy about how we were going to provide education to the students. And our faculty were hesitant to use um, teleconferencing which and video conferencing, which many um, programs have used. Um, so we actually have taken a unique approach for distance education. And essentially what we have done is we have actually flipped our entire curriculum. So if you're not familiar with what a flipped classroom means, um, it means that instead of coming to class and having that knowledge transfer happening during class time, students complete pre-class materials prior to coming to class that expose them to the content. They then come to class and then um, dive into case studies, um, different active learning strategies to get them involved and apply that information and then they um, study further outside of class. And so some of you may wonder how we are doing this with our extension campus. So we have about 130 students here in Spokane, about, uh, there's 37 um, Yakima students in our first year class right now. And so all of those students complete the same pre-class materials, okay? And so these might be video recordings, it might be a journal article, it may be um, some type of practice problems that they have to go to, through and solve. They then show up on their extension campus. So Spokane students come to Spokane, Yakima students come to Yakima. And there is a faculty member in each um, campus that helps to coordinate the in-class activities. And there's a high level of communication that happens between our Spokane and Yakima uh, faculty members to ensure that there is a similar experience that happens in class on both campuses. The students then do additional outside of class study time and then they take the assessments on their campuses at the same time. We use computerized testing throughout um, using exam soft throughout the College of Pharmacy. So 
we are in the initial stages still of implementation. So last year we rolled this out with our first year class. We're now implementing this for our second year um, class of students. So then um, we, we are a four year program, so next year will be third year, and then of course we'll have our fourth year. Um, so we're only part way through this, and so we don't have any hard data on outcomes and things necessarily, but overall we have seen that this is success. The students in Yakima feel very engaged with, and have a great connection with their instructor. So, my focus though today is just talking about how we have used educational technology to make this happen. Um, we have highly relied on all kinds of different things that WSU provides as well as different free technologies that are out there. So in creating pre-class activities, many of us, all of us use Blackboard, many of us use Panopto for recording of short videos, many of us will use screencasting and if you're not familiar with screencasting, I have a couple images here on the right side where, for instance, I teach calculations. It's very hard to teach math through a PowerPoint. And so I actually will have practice problems where I will write out with a stylus and work through those practice problems. Um, so uh, many of us use that. Many of us have used YouTube videos. Um, there's lots of different things that we're doing here in the College of Pharmacy. So in terms of the actual in-class time, we also use technology, so whether it's having students use quizzes or drop boxes through Blackboard to upload assignments, we highly use audience response systems. Um, a number of these are free that we have access to. Um, so Kahoot is one of them, which I hopefully will have time to show you here towards the end of the presentation. Um, Socrative is another free one that allows you to go in and um, upload answers and uh, direct students towards a correct answer. Piazza is another one. Many of us use Google Documents, simulations, all kinds of different in-class um, um, technology uh, to help facilitate our classrooms. <coughs> so many of you may uh, wonder what this class looks like. So this is a picture from my pharmaceutics class. So not only do I lead up kind of faculty development efforts for the College of Pharmacy, but I'm also um, highly involved in teaching our first year students. So I've been through and have gone through and flipped all of my courses. And so I am no longer up here at the front of the podium. Um, I am circling the room helping students to answer questions. They then all have their laptops or their other electronic devices out. They are going through these uh, practice problems that I have and then using educational, um, these audience response systems to go through and verify their answers. And then they flag me over when there's a big misconception where they don't understand a topic. And so I'm using my time um, more as a guide in helping to facilitate their education rather than being that talking head that's at the front of the room. And then outside of class, um, we're continuing to use um, academic technology. So many of us use discussion boards. We have online office hours, virtual chat rooms, trying to get our students connected um, on both campuses. Okay, so this is my contact information. Um, so feel free to email me. Um, but right now I want to show you one of the technologies that we use, which is completely free, and it is called Kahoot. And the way that you get to it is you go to uh, getkahoot.com, um, okay? So you can just Google Kahoot. And you can sign up for a free account. This is a gamified version of a quiz, basically, or you can also use it as a survey platform. Um, so I have a <coughs> one question uh, Kahoot here that we'll go ahead and try to see if we can do this on multiple campuses. So this is a trivia question. And so what I want you all to do once I get this started is you will go to kahoot.it. So open up your device and you can hear the music really loud, well. sorry. After you've uh, done enough of these, the music gets kind of annoying. I will give you that amount. Uh, so enter your web browser, go to kahoot.it, and then it will ask you for a game pin. And then you'll enter in 727794. And then you'll ask you for a nickname. So you can either use your real name or a nickname. Students like to make up funny nicknames because they all display here. So this can be used for like attendance purposes. We have had some faculty that have used it for that. 
uh, to give participation points for class attendance. Um, you can have them, for instance, enter in their student ID number um, to make it easier to track. All right. Is everyone in that would like to be in? Once you do this one time with your students, they get the hang of this and then they automatically log in because our students are so tech savvy. It says I'm in, but I don't see my nickname. Okay, so it'll, if you're in, you, you, you should be able to, once I launch it, you'll be able oh, to okay. see the question. Okay, so then once I launch this, you'll see the question and then on your device, you'll see four colored squares. And those four color squares um, relate to the four answer choices, it's multiple choice answer. And so then you will uh, select your uh, appropriate color. Now the thing with Kahoot is that it will be based on how quickly you answer as well as if you answer correctly. And so uh, you want to try to answer as quickly as possible. All right, so if you push start. So there's just one trivia question about Washington State. So what is the state gym in Washington? So then it will give you four choices to choose from. So then you pick the color that coordinates with that answer. So then you can set this to be as long as or as short of a question time as you want. And so then you can see it gives you a nice distribution. And so this is a great way to do some just-in-time teaching where you can go through and clarify misconceptions that the students might have. Uh, and so you can see Petrified Wood here is the actual state gym of Washington. And then so whoever Kahoot was is the winner of this. So it will list the top uh, winners. So then I usually have some type of prize or something for them, some kind of cheesy little prize that they can earn. Um, this is a completely free software. It's really fun. Students really enjoy it. I, I use this in my classes as a kind of formative assessment at the beginning of each class to have the students kind of see where they are in knowing um, the material from those pre-class assignments. All right. Um, I know we kind of are short on time, I, um, but I wanted to ask. a quick question ask, about Kahoot. Oh, yes, please. Yes. Um, on, the, on the back end, when you're done, do you have a report of what everyone did? Correct. So if you do have a report, so you can go to this feedback and learning. Um, so it allows you to rate it. So then it allows you to download a Excel sheet. So then you can see all your guys' participant names here. So then you can see who answered what and have a, an output. So yeah, nice. I, I don't use this particular function. I just use it as a fun, formative thing to get students engaged. But you can go through and use this for participation points um, to look at overall performance of students. Thank you. It's a fun little thing that you can uh, do in your class that easily incorporates technology. All right. Any questions that I can help answer about what we're doing here in the College of Pharmacy? <laughs> Connie, this is Rebecca. I get a, two pretty common questions about flipped classrooms. <coughs> One is, mm -hmm. how do you get the students to engage with the content before coming to class? So a lot of faculty mm -hmm. talk about creating the video lectures and then students don't watch them and then they come to class and they're not prepared to engage. Um, so how do you address mm -hmm. that? And then on the other side of that, if you're putting a lot of your content out there before class, how do you get them to come to class? Ah, great. Okay, so we, we're not necessarily a perfect strategy here. You know, that's kind of the... Uh, your screen so we can see your face. Oh, sure. How about now? I, I'm appearing back there, so it should, it should work. Okay, so accountability and getting students to attend class are the two biggest issues. And so my approach is to provide incentives. Um, I'm more of a carrot, you know, give them a carrot rather than force them with a stick. Um, but you could take either of those approaches. In terms of getting them to do pre-class materials, many uh, faculty will have some type of quiz, for instance, utilizing Blackboard that they have to complete 
prior to class that's automatically set up and will populate into the, the grade book. That's a, an easy way of uh, trying to get them accountable for completing those pre-class materials. In terms of getting them to come to class, um, I highly recommend making the in-class experience worthwhile. Students will quickly learn that if they come to class, it helps them to prepare for an assessment. They'll come to class, even if your class is at 8 a.m. So whether it's you give them practice problems, for instance, that may be similar to what an assessment might be like, or you make it so that they actually have participation points that kind of are, are another driver to get students motivated to come to class. So those, those are some strategies, um, but I do agree with you that those are kind of two big issues uh, with a flipped classroom is trying to get students to do their pre-class materials and then getting them ultimately to come to class. Any other questions I could help answer? A question here from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to connect this with Blackboard to download a grading? Oh, to or connect to who? <laughs> I do not believe Kahoot has been linked with Blackboard, um, but I don't know that for sure. Um, I would have to get one of the tech uh, folks to answer that question, but I don't believe there's a linkage, at least yet. Um, Kahoot is a kind of a free platform right now. Um, I assume eventually it might be uh, something that you have to pay for to use, but uh, as of right now, it's still free. But you could do similar things, for instance, through Blackboard. Um, you can use Piazza, which is linked through Blackboard, and you can do kind of these survey responses to questions. Um, it's not quite as fun. It's not gamified with fun music, uh, but there are other ways to do this that would link through Blackboard. I have a quick follow-up, Connie. It's Phil from Pullman. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, the <coughs> fact that you generate an Excel spreadsheet that you can export, it's easy to import that into Blackboard uh, as long as the class mm -hmm. lists are aligned. So that would involve less clicks than some other options. Then I was interested mm -hmm. in your uh, sort of remote and flipped combination, and I wonder if you're seeing <coughs> a lot of interaction between the Yakima students and the Spokane students. I could understand if they form sort of two groups, um, you know, in, in reflection, you'd want to make sure their performance is pretty uh, much the same, but are they talking to each other across the state? That's a great question. Um, so many of our students do talk socially with each other. They all have, they're all part of a Facebook group and they'll use social media together. But in terms of the actual interactions that occur between our Spokane students and our Yakima students, there's not really a whole lot of those. A lot of them, they have kind of segregated into their two groups. And so uh, the Yakima students, because they're such a smaller cohort, they have a very strong niche kind of community that helps each other out. Um, it's, it's quite amazing how different, you know, the 35, 37 students in Yakima are compared to our 130 students here in Spokane, where it's such a bigger cohort where um, they don't necessarily know all of each other, uh, but Yakima students are there to support each other. Um, but there's not, from what I know as an instructor, there's not necessarily a lot of communication that happens between uh, the two campuses. That's something that we're hoping to uh, try to develop more, um, and so that it could be something that we could use technology tools to do in the future. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I guess we'll hand this off to the next speaker. Great, thanks, Connie. And now we have Willie Kushwa from the Vancouver campus. Yeah. At least I'll be able to see. <laughs> so just a question, I sent my slides in. Are you gonna pull them up or do I need to pull them up here? I guess nobody can hear us. Willie, you need to press send content on your um, remote for the video conferencing. Oh, so I am going to have to pull mine up? Yeah, we got okay. it. Cool. I think they have yours as a backup. Oh, oh. oh sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Let's get this. Okay. Okay, um, thank you very much. It's, I'm unsure where I'm supposed to be looking. There's a camera back there, so I'll look there. Um, my name is Willie Kushwa. I'm an adjunct faculty member here at WSU, um, a full-time faculty member at Clark Community College. 
And I've been engaged in teaching online and hybrid classes for about the last eight years, and it's been a tremendous learning experience. And one of the things I appreciate about this particular session is the opportunity to learn from other people. Um, I've already taken some notes about some things that I would like to integrate into my classes, so I certainly appreciate this opportunity. If you looked at the title given for my presentation, in the handout, it looks different than what you're seeing here. That's because Michael and I talked. There's going to be a session on hybrid classes this afternoon, and I think we'll get into more detail about hybrid classes at that point. Um, I'm fascinated with comments and the discussion on the flipped classroom model because I use that as well um, with some success and with some shortcomings. So we could almost hold an entire session on flipped classroom teaching. And I think that would be advantageous as well. The purpose of my talk today is to really just show you some of the software tools that I have used um, in the process of forming my classes and teaching my on class, on, online classes and hybrid classes, both uh, here at WSU and at Clark. So I'm just going to go through and show you specific tools. Um, there are different versions of these tools that are out there, but these are the versions that I've selected, and I found them um, very helpful for my purposes. And I think that's one of the, the biggest hurdles potentially for faculty members looking at integrating technology is which technology should I use. And so I think having people share their technologies and their preferences is very valuable because there's no need to reinvent the wheel every time uh, we approach teaching. And so uh, the first program is called Snagit. Uh, this is, uh, some of you may remember Jing and some of you may have heard of Camtasia before. Uh, Snagit is an in-between package, which is perfect for me. I initially looked at Camtasia. It has features that I would never use. Uh, it's, it's just designed for people with a much higher level of interest in editing video. And so Snagit is available from TechSmith on an individual license for about $50. And this is, I'm just showing you the page itself. If you go into TechSmith or you just Google Snagit, it'll bring you to this particular page. There's a really nice video um, that in a minute and a half shows you quite a variety of features that Snagit can do. Um, as I mentioned, you can download uh, this and also for an individual license, it's $49.95. So again, I try to look for technologies that are $100 or less. But one of the things that's interesting is you can see the volume discounts. And I think this would be one of the really unique opportunities for WSU is to work with faculty to decide on technologies that the faculty would like to use and then leverage that in terms of volume purchasing or perhaps uh, campus licenses. So I won't show the, the short video, but again, I just wanted to point out where you would be going to get information about this. The way I use Snagit is for individual screen capture, but also for recording videos. And I won't play this particular video, but I um, use the textbook extensively. Uh, I created an open education resources textbook uh, this last year, and so uh, I won't play it. But um, what I do is I uh, take my image of the figure in the book, and I have a little mini lecture. And I don't write a script for it. I pretend that I'm sitting there in a classroom teaching it. Um, it's created quite some interest in my hallway when people walk by and they hear me talking, and then I open the door and there's no one else in there and they're wondering, what am I doing? I record uh, these video clips as a sort of a mini lecture, because when I switch to fully online as well as hybrid or even the flipped model, if you're doing face-to-face, -face, there has to be a way to share this content with students. And so me talking about the content is very valuable, students have told me. Um, it gives them a sense of connection with me as well, because they're hearing their instructor talk about something. And the terminology and the explanations that I use are reflected on my assessments. And so again, they find that valuable um, as well. The second program I use is embedded within Blackboard itself, and it's called Blackboard Collaborate. I use this in my totally online classes to have interactive uh, conversations with the students in real time. And I'll show you, um, this is available under your tools. So if you go to your tools, and then you'll see Blackboard Collaborate. And uh, setting up a session in Blackboard Collaborate is, is very easy. Um, a, a short tutorial video could accomplish that. It's just many people, it's one more piece of technology that unless you've actually used it before, you may have a hurdle in terms of actually uh, trying it. And so this is, as with all technologies, I encourage you to try it on a small scale before you implement it on a larger scale. And so when I first started, I conducted some Collaborate sessions with my family. 
um, and just tried to make sure I had as many of the technology bugs worked out as I possibly could. So in uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, you can turn on the video camera. So there's a picture of you, which the students really like. Uh, they get to know you as a person through, um, I think, seeing your facial expressions, your voice, et cetera. Um, you can see this is uh, completely voluntary. And I have about 15% um, of the class will show up at any time. The beauty of Collaborate is you record the sessions. So even though students can't attend, they can listen to the recording. And also students will email me questions that they have. I'll answer those questions. And then they can view the recording at a later time. I also use this uh, for reviewing tests to save time in class uh, for, or a conference perhaps in going through. I will record a discussion of me going through each of the test questions, and giving an explanation, some detailed feedback to the students. So I use it primarily for those two purposes, but I'm sure there are very many creative faculty members that could perhaps come up with other uses uh, for that as well. So that's a tool that I use. The uh, next tool that I use is a program called StudyMate uh, Author, and this is a $100 program. And I use this to provide activities for students to learn terminology. And this applies whether it's a lower division class or an upper division class. So I use these, this particular tool in all the classes that I teach to help students with terminology. And so I just wanted to show you the format of the program itself. The way it works is you type in uh, terms and definitions, and there are also opportunities for inserting pictures and audio clips as well. So you can make picture flashcards, you can make audio flashcards, uh, et cetera. Um, there are also multiple choice and fact cards, so there are a variety of different things. I use it primarily for uh, definitions. And so what I'll do is type in the term, uh, type in the definition, and then as you enter them, you see at the screen below, there's a list of the terms and the uh, definitions. Then you publish this as a file, and what it does is it takes that information and it creates a variety of activities for the students to use. And that's what I love, is I create one file, and out of that one file come about five different activities that students can use depending on their preference. So I just wanted to show you several of these uh, examples. This is what it looks like when I upload it into um, Blackboard. And so the students can uh, click on any one of these links. Flashcards, pick a letter, fill in the blank, matching crosswords. And there's also a glossary option uh, at the end. And so uh, this is what a flashcard looks. I really like this because you can either start with the definition or you can start with the term itself. So the student can alter that as they're going through. They can shuffle the cards, and then as they learn a definition, they can click don't show the card again. So they become more and more efficient on focusing on terms that they don't know rather than going back through. Um, this also saves students considerable time rather than having students write out, and there could be said to be some benefit of students writing out their own definitions. Um, this is a way that saves them some time while hopefully, at least in many cases that have been reported to me, helping them learn about the terminology. Um, the second uh, example is a uh, fill in the blank uh, where they're given the definition and this particular um, version has a game component to it. In other words, there are a certain number of points the students can earn on each of the questions and so it, it provides for some students some internal motivation. The next type of game format is a fill in the blank um, in the sense that I give a definition, the students will enter the answer. They can also at the bottom get a hint and uh, it also, if they just completely give up, it will show them the answer. So, but again, you can see there's a scoring component uh, that's a possibility here. Um, the other one is a matching situation where they're given a list of uh, terms, which one goes with that particular definition. And the last one, which personally I hate, but many students love, is crossword puzzle option. So um, I've had a number of students tell me that they really enjoy this. And it's a great way to get them involved in the technology um, to learn these terms in a way that they find most helpful to themselves. So again, you enter the terms one time, it automatically creates all these different game options uh, for them. The last thing that many students like is a glossary. And what students can do is click on the All button, and it'll give them a list of all the terms. If any letter that's shaded in, it means there wasn't a particular term with that letter. But it'll give them all the definitions. They can copy and paste it into a Word document and uh, some students like that option to have it as sort of a glossary right next to them when they're doing the work. 
Okay, the next tool that I use is one called OpenMind, and again, there are lots of different software packages for doing this. Uh, I like this one because it's relatively inexpensive, and I like the features that it provides. Um, I use the OpenMind software for uh, concept mapping. And this discussion, or the decision to use this particular tool came about as a discussion with my wife. I was talking with her about my lower division students struggling, and she said, well, how are you accommodating the learning style of those students that are very visual learners? And they need to see the big picture. I said, that's a really good point. I'm not doing anything for them. So uh, what I did was I found this particular software package. Again, it's called OpenMind. And it does a lot of different types of mapping activities, as you'll see on the next screen. You can do what they call mind mapping, brainstorming, or flowcharts. I use the mind mapping, and I create uh, concept maps. And these concept maps are very helpful for students that need to see the big picture in a very clean way. And it also helps them to create a scaffolding for when they're doing the reading, they can take notes directly on this uh, particular outline if they choose to do so. For some students, it's very helpful. For other students, they don't use the particular tool. But again, what I'm trying to do is to provide a variety of resources that would be helpful for students with different learning styles. Now, uh, one option that you could do is to try to wean students off of the fully created concept maps. That's something I haven't tried yet, but it's certainly something that I'm thinking about. OK, another component to my online classes and my hybrid classes is having uh, activities. I teach biological sciences, and so I found uh, two sites for those of you that teach uh, science uh, that may be helpful for in-class as well as perhaps online activities. The first is called FET. It was set up initially as a physics education technology site, but there are all types of simulations that are on it now. And so this is just one that I picked out of biology that's showing uh, nerve transmission. Um, but they're ones for physics, chemistry, et cetera. Uh, this is a simulation that looks at pH. And so what I do is I create worksheets uh, or directions that guide students through the simulation, and then I ask them questions about it. And for my lower division classes, one of the primary learning objectives is the scientific method and actually being able to apply the scientific method. These are lower division non-majors. And so I'll use these simulations to accomplish that purpose. The other software package, which, um, I'm sorry, this is just another shot of sewing a simulation on build an atom. So we talk about chemistry, and it's very um, intangible for some students. And this particular program gives them a chance to create molecules. Then they can rotate the molecules and see uh, different aspects about them. The other program that I've used in one of my online uh, classes is called the EduWeb Labs. It's quite a bit of, I hope everybody's OK. <laughs> I did quite a bit of uh, research. There are lots of very high-tech, uh, glitzy uh, lab simulation programs. The problem is they cost students anywhere from 50 to over $100. And on a quarter system, uh, which I use at Clark, that's a challenge for students. And so um, I use this particular program. It has a ver it's not glitzy, but it's very sound. And it has a tremendous number of activities that I've developed labs for that have been very helpful. And so you can see it applies to chemistry, general biology, AP biology, earth science, as well as physics. Um, so what we do is uh, our students pay a $5 fee to participate in labs to help furnish lab supplies, et cetera, for the face-to-face -face labs. We've just carried that over to the EduWeb labs, and that $5 fee pays for our subscription to uh, this particular site so that the students don't have to come up with yet another fee uh, to, uh, to pay in the course of signing up for the class. And this is just one of the simulations that I use. It's called osmosis and diffusion. Uh, directions are on the left-hand side. The simulation is on the right. They conduct the simulation. We can formulate questions. They can conduct experiments to answer those questions. And then they write up a lab report. And I would say, just anecdotally, my sense of their understanding of the scientific method uh, has been greatly improved. Uh, students can uh, take a question and do a hypothesis, a prediction. The design of the experiment is fairly set, but then they have to collect the data, analyze the data. I use a program where they graph the data, and then they submit all of that to me via learning management system for grading. So, and I think that's it. Yeah. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have had about any of those particular packages or anything else that uh, might be a question on your mind. Uh, Willie, will you <laughs> stop sharing your content as well so we can see your face? Oh, 
Okay, stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah, we have just yes. a couple more minutes if there's questions for Willie. Sure. Yeah, uh, Willie, I have a question for you. Um, did you use any other lab software before you went to EduWeb Labs? No, I didn't. Okay, so you don't necessarily know how it compares to Oh, no. Stuff. What I did was one of my primary driving forces is cost. Yeah. And so I, I spent weeks, several weeks investigating different options. And I'm sure there are programs out there that are a lot mm -hmm. slicker, but again, the price tag was the... But you're, you're meeting your outcomes with... I'm this. meeting my outcomes with... Yeah, students have said, you know, uh, the students actually didn't say anything. Other faculty said, wow, that looks kind of archaic in terms of today's high-tech images and things like that. But again, it accomplishes the purpose at a low cost for the students. We're, we're looking for uh, some lab uh, stuff for um, uh, anatomy and physiology. I know oh, that boy, anatomy and physiology has quite uh, a re array of resources that are available. Yeah. For online labs, so you're gonna, you're gonna. I'll, I'll tell you what. I don't teach anatomy and physiology yeah. per se, but I can hook you up with Clark's teachers who are quite knowledgeable about that. Thank you. Any other questions that I could help with? Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So that concludes our overview panel. Um, can we have a round of applause for Phil, Connie, and Willie? I think that was great. Uh, I do want to check on a couple of things. One, did all of the food arrive on all of the campuses? <laughs> yes, is there anybody that yes. didn't yes. get there? Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, and so for you in Pullman who aren't aware, it is in the kitchen over here, there's beverages and pastries. Also, uh, please make sure you sign in. We have a sign-in sheet uh, on our table here. There's a sign-in sheet in each, on, in each room on each campus. So um, let us know you're here, which sessions you're attending, and whether you're fa faculty, graduate student, or staff. All right, so we are ready for our next panel, which I think is coming from Pullman.